Thanks for tuning in to No Trash, Just Truth, a podcast of Proverbs 910 Ministries with your hosts, Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. Be sure to check out our other podcast, 5 a.m. Theology, available on all platforms. And give him the glory, great things he has done. Welcome back. In today's episode, we're going to start talking about the Protestant Reformation. Usually when we hear that phrase, Rose, one of the first things that comes to mind is Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the door in Wittenberg, Germany. But when it comes to the Reformation, Martin Luther's hammering came after a long line of people from many parts of Europe who were starting to disagree to some extent with the Roman Catholic Church's teachings. Many were disgusted with the actions of the Roman Church and the lack of morality that was found in its ranks, and that includes the popes, as we gave you a list last week. While there were a lot of early dissenters, not all of them would have agreed with the five solas that came out of the Reformation. They weren't all in agreement of a lot of things, but they were dissenting and pushing back against the Roman Catholic Church. Right, and what they would have agreed on was that the Roman Catholic idea of the church was rife with issues and needed reform. Remember, we said they deformed the church in the dark ages. And what the reformers and many others who came before them did was start pushing back against the Roman Catholic Church. There's no way to cover every single person, group, or event that led up to the Reformation. And honestly, it could be that a lot, even history doesn't even know some of the people behind the scenes. I'm sure. But- We want to start our Reformation coverage by giving you kind of a whirlwind tour country by country and show you what was happening in those countries leading up to that famous day in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517. If you remember our last episode, you know that a lot happened in the church between the 4th and the 15th centuries, both good and bad. The church was given political power under Emperor Constantine which brought both a sigh of relief from persecution, as well as bringing great corruption into it. Great theologians were raised up, such as Augustine. There were councils held, which produced solid biblical doctrine that shaped Christianity. And two big things that happened were Pope Gregory declared that the care of the whole church had been placed in the hands of the papacy. What the Pope said was deemed truth and was to be adhered to. The second thing was that in 756 AD, the papal state was established in Italy, effectively making the Roman church its own governing body. Yeah, and another big happening in the Roman church was the instituting of military expeditions called the Crusades. Now, we didn't get a chance to talk about them last week, so we'll talk about them here. The Crusades were organized in response to Muslim wars of expansion. And the objective was to stop the spread of Islam and retake control of the Holy Land in Eastern Mediterranean. They were also to conquer pagan areas and Christianize them and recapture formerly Christian territories. So there were numerous expeditions into the Holy Land, into Spain and into other places. The first crusade was launched in 1095 and they went through to the time of the Protestant Reformation when they started to decline rapidly then. We told you last week that we would be defining what indulgences are in the Roman Catholic Church. Before we step back into the pre-Reformation era, we're going to define what indulgences and some of the other terms that you're going to be hearing over and over again in the next few weeks means. Yeah, the things that we're going to define were some of the things that the Roman Church was being called to reform. If you remember, we said they deformed the church during this time. Many have to do with the Catholic Church's heretical views about forgiveness of sins. So, Chris, we'll start by talking about penance. If you remember, we said that Jerome, who interpreted scripture in the Vulgate in the 400s, he wrongly interpreted repentance, as is in the original scriptures, as do penance. 
And we said that problems started in the church right away or pretty early on because of the use of the teachings of the early church fathers and the Didache over and above the Bible. This led to the Catholic Church teaching things like that infants or newly confessing adults must be baptized and that their initial baptism removes any sin that they have already. But they believe that something further needs to be done. And they're not just talking about repentance once you start sinning again after your baptism. And this was called the sacrament of reconciliation. They believed it needed to be fulfilled. So this is what the sacrament of reconciliation looked like. When someone sinned after they were baptized, there had to be repentance or contrition, but there also had to be reparations made. So this led to the practice of confessing your sin to a presiding priest or another member of the clergy. And you had to confess to a member of the clergy because if you remember, we said last week that the church stated that only the clergy could determine whether or not absolution from sin was granted. They were holding the power of forgiveness. And after the person confessed, that priest or other clergy member would tell the confessor to perform certain acts of satisfaction, which is what penance is. They had to make amends or pay someone back for wrong. These acts that were prescribed by the priests were to be performed by the penitent sinner in order for them to pay for their sin and to show they were truly contrite about their sin. The penance prescribed by the priest for the confessing sinner could vary depending on the severity of their sin. A sinner could be prescribed fasting or donation to the poor or donation to the church or something more severe. One example of severe penance was flagellation. Sometimes flagellation was done by groups of people together called flagellants, and they moved from town to town beating themselves until they were bloody in order to pay for their sins. Because obviously to the church then, to the priest, Jesus didn't do enough. Right. The flagellants would draw blood by beating themselves with corks that were studded with needles. And they followed this ritual because they were seeking the pardon of the Madonna or Mary and they were looking for her divine intervention against famine or a scarce harvest or something else. When it came to penance, the priest would only give absolution for the person's sin after the sinner had fulfilled his or her prescribed act of reparation. That changed in 1095 when Pope Urban II authorized armed pilgrimage, or, or in other words, the crusading, as a super satisfactory act that completed all penance owed for the confessed sins. The burden of penance for forgiveness of sin weighed heavily on a Christian. So to many back then, this was an incredible opportunity to lift their burden. But you would want to know that you had absolution before you went to war because you might not come back. So the priests started offering absolution before the penance was actually completed. Sounds like a powerful manipulation tool. It sure does. Because of the average person's inability to fully satisfy the debt of their sin through acts of penance, around 1230, the Roman church began offering other ways to complete or at least lessen the amount a person owed for their sin. And they did this through acts that benefited the church. Surprise, surprise. And this became known as indulgences. While crusading was still the only total sin debt wiping indulgence, bishops eventually offered the people partial debt release through attendance at church, the veneration of relics, the giving of alms, donations for the building of churches, for monasteries, for hospitals, or even bridges, as well as the supporting of the crusades through prayer and finances. Always comes back to money with the Catholic Church. It sure does. I'm kind of surprised about prayer being thrown in there. Yeah. Well, that's probably just to make it sound like it's scriptural. Yeah. And real. The Roman Catholic Church taught that when a person did these good works, they purchased extra grace or extra righteousness for themselves from a super abundant store of righteousness that was kept in heaven. And that super abundant store is called the treasury of merit. Where did this extra righteousness come from that's in this treasury? Well, the church taught that Christ, his mother Mary, who they believed was sinless, 
and the people that the Catholic Church deemed were worthy of sainthood had this extra merit. Christ's righteousness is without question, but the Roman Catholics teach that Mary and the saints were all overabundantly righteous, especially Mary. They taught that along with Jesus, that all Mary and all these other saints, they were righteous enough to earn heaven on their own merit. Chris, they didn't need salvation. They earned it. Yep. So because they earned salvation on their own, they had lots of grace extra that they put into the treasury. Now, of course, we know that Romans 3.23 says, all fall short of the glory of God. And that certainly includes Mary and any saints. But that's not how the church saw it. The treasury of merit isn't only used to lessen a person's penance. As the idea of purgatory became more fully defined and developed between the 11th and 12th centuries, the Roman Catholics instituted the purchase of indulgences to lessen a person's time spent in purgatorial suffering. Back to money but, again. Back to money. Purgatory is defined as an interim place after death where a person's soul is purified through punishment. Not only could you buy indulgences to shorten your own time of suffering after death, you could also buy indulgences for your already deceased loved ones to lessen their time in this purgatorial suffering place. In the Reformation era, there were even indulgence promoters that were also called questers selling indulgences, some who unscrupulously absconded with the money. Imagine that. There was corruption because this <laughs> just seems so biblical and out on the up and up. Yeah. We mentioned the word veneration, Chris. Well, veneration means to regard someone with reverential respect. But in the Roman Catholic Church, the act of veneration was used to mean to honor an icon, a relic, or someone that the church has officially recognized as a saint with a ritual act of devotion. They also use the word veneration to mean to worship or pay homage to something or someone. Now, the Black Death that ravaged Europe from 1347 to 1351 led the Roman church's teaching that saints are mediators between God and humans. They taught that people needed to venerate and pray to the saints who had the power to mediate for healing or for protection from the Black Death. Well, tell one third of Europe that. Right. The church called for the veneration of Mary and the other saints. They came up with three steps to sainthood. A candidate becomes venerable, then blessed, and then they're deemed a saint. Venerable is the title given to a deceased person who's recognized formally by the Pope as having lived a heroically virtuous life and or someone who offered their life. To be beatified and recognized as blessed, one miracle acquired through the candidate's intercession was required in addition to recognizing that they were a heroic person of virtue or offering their life. To be canonized required a second miracle after beatification. Of course, Rose, the Pope gave himself the authority to waive all of these requirements or any of them. Did it require a financial transaction? I would say probably <laughs> most certainly. Many reformers called for this to stop and they called for the destruction of images and the icons that were also being venerated in the Roman church and the ones calling for the destruction of them were called iconoclasts. In the 14th century, the Roman church came up with 14 holy helpers or saints who were at your disposal for help. We'll give you a couple examples. St. Joseph, who's the husband of Mary. The church claimed that Joseph had many private revelations from God. They deemed him the terror of the demons because when you prayed to him, he would help you fight against temptation of any kind. Then there was St. Christopher. The church taught that after his conversion to Christianity, Christopher devoted his life to carrying travelers across the river. So therefore, he became the saint that you would pray to when you wanted safe travel somewhere. And Chris, we'll just do one more. St. Anthony, who was declared a saint in 1232. He was a teacher to friars. So the legend is that in 1224, his book of Psalms and teaching notes was stolen. He prayed for it to be returned, 
And guess what? The thief returned it. So that is why the church deemed St. Anthony the saint you pray to when you lose anything and you want it found. So the reformers called for change in the Roman church's false teachings about penance, purgatory, indulgences, veneration, and a lot more. Long before Martin Luther picked up his hammer, the theology and the actions of the Roman church and its hierarchy were being called into question from every part of Christendom, really. So we're going to start this flyby look at different parts of Europe and some of the pre-Reformation stands that they took against the Roman church. Some of these people may not be as familiar to us as Luther and Calvin. They probably really are not. But their stories are important and they're very interesting. These people and many others sacrificed much and many gave their lives, some dying pretty violently for the sake of the purity of Christ's church. Chris, in last week's episode, we mentioned the disagreement between the Eastern and Western churches over ecclesiastical and theological issues. They disagreed on subjects ranging from whether to use leavened or unleavened bread in the Eucharist. There were disagreements over the Pope's claim to universal jurisdiction. And like we said, this disagreement eventually resulted in what's called the Great Schism of 1054. It's also referred to as the East-West Schism. And that separated the Eastern Orthodox churches, which today are mostly known as Greek Orthodox churches, from the Roman Catholic Church. And we mention it again in this episode because this event was an important precursor to the pre-Reformation activity, as we're going to see. We're going to start our European tour with the pre-Reformation activity happening in Roman Catholic-controlled France. Not long after the Great Schism, in 1101, Henry of Lausanne, a monk from the monastery in Clungy, France, became disgusted by the corruption that he saw in the Roman Church. He was so disgusted to the point that he could no longer live under the order or the vows that he had taken. Henry left the monastery and became a preacher in the town of Lausanne. He preached vigorously of repentance from sin and warned against what he called sham Christianity, which included warning men about their false guides, which was the clergy of the Roman church, whose example, according to Henry's standards, promoted nothing but wickedness. Taking advantage of an opportunity to preach for four months in the town of Le Mans, Henry of Lausanne taught such things as rejection of the doctrinal authority of the church, recognition of the gospel as the sole rule of faith. He condemned the idea of praying for the dead and he condemned the sacrifice of mass. That's the Roman Catholic understanding of the Lord's Supper that there's a re-sacrificing of Christ at each mass. And doing that denies the once for all death of Jesus as we're told in Hebrews 9, 23 to 28. Besides the whole re-sacrificing in the Eucharist, Chris, the second major problem with Rome's understanding of the Lord's Supper is its view of Christ's presence in the sacrament, something that's called transubstantiation. So Henry of Lausanne's teaching against the Roman church set the people who heard him on a course of protestation, even to the point of some monasteries being threatened with violence. The results of Henry's laboring for 10 years in the south of France had profound effects that were written about by Bernard of Clairvaux, and that's an abbot in the Roman church. Yeah, this is what he wrote about Henry's influence. The churches are without flocks. The flocks are without priests. The priests are nowhere treated with due reverence. The churches are leveled down to synagogues. The sacraments are not esteemed holy, and the festivals are no longer celebrated. He made a big impact. But it doesn't say anything that he misrepresented scripture. No, it doesn't, because it can't say that. Seems to be all things they got a problem with that are against the church's teachings. Oh, yeah. And Henry was arrested as a heretic and condemned to imprisonment for life in 1148. He died in prison the following year. Stabs at reforming the Roman church continued in France. In 1174, a wealthy merchant named Peter Waldo, who was a resident of Lyons, France, 
He renounced his wealth and started giving his money away and committed to a life of voluntary poverty. Two years later, he became a traveling lay preacher. There were others that joined him and they became known as the poor men of Lyons. These were the origins of the religious group that became known as the Waldensians. Eventually, these street preachers consisted of both men and women. While they considered themselves Roman Catholic, they soon ran into problems with the Roman church due to the fact that they had no formal training as clergy and because they were handing out Bibles in the everyday language of the people instead of the Latin Vulgate. Now, keep in mind at that point in history, these copies would have had to each be handwritten. That's a lot of dedication. Yeah, that's for sure. And Chris, that formal clergy training that you're talking about, as we looked at, sometimes just consisted of someone paying your way to be ordained. Yeah, or just being a relative. Yeah. Although they were told to stop, they continued on with their message of true repentance, evangelism through public preaching, and the personal study of scripture in one's own language. The Waldensians insisted on the Bible being the sole authority. They rejected the authority of the Pope. The Waldensians also criticized the corruption of the Roman clergy, their traditions, such as praying for the dead, and they even spoke against the doctrine of purgatory and against indulgences. Their movement quickly spread. It spread to Spain, Northern France, Germany, Southern Italy, Poland, and Hungary. As you can guess, the Roman church did not take any of this lightly. And in 1181, the Archbishop of Lyons excommunicated them. Three years later, the Pope declared them heretics. Persecution against the Waldensians lasted for 300 years with the death penalty for anybody who they caught who refused to recant their beliefs. Leaders of various groups were hunted down. The Waldensians went underground and some retreated to remote areas like the Alps. And they did that because it's the only way they could survive. But they'd already affected change in the areas that they'd preached in. And one of those areas was Bohemia, that's now known as the Czech Republic. The Bohemian Church was originally established in 863 by the Eastern Orthodox Church and namely by two brothers who were also missionaries. At that time, the Eastern and Western churches were still united and they did cooperate with each other, but with tensions, especially between corrupt and jealous clergy members. Imagine that. The brothers worked with the Church of Rome in organizing and administrating parishes, but the tension left the clergy in Bohemia struggling to fully submit to the authority of Rome. However, eventually, the Bohemian Church did submit to following the Roman Catholicism practices. When the Waldensians got to Bohemia in the early 13th century, they influenced the people in the local parishes to start noticing stark contrasts between the luxury and the opulence of the Roman Church and the simplicity and the poverty of their own lives. They preached the same condemnations of unbiblical Roman teachings and doctrines as they preached everywhere else, spurring on some men from the Bohemian church to become early reformers, men who were precursors to the well-known Bohemian reformer, John Huss. One of those who came before Huss was a priest and theologian named Conrad von Waldhase, and he preached from 1345 to 1369. Waldhausey was an Augustinian monk who preached a message of repentance and directed the people towards moral and religious improvement. Now, while he didn't attack the doctrines of the Roman church directly, he did call out its monks and its orders of mendicant friars. These were the men who traveled in urban areas instead of living in monasteries. And he called them out for their hypocrisy and for their depraved character. And he made a lot of powerful enemies doing that. And he was brought up on 29 charges. However, no one showed up for his trial to testify against him. So he was able to defend himself. That's a great way to be able to defend yourself. Yeah. Another early reformer before Haas was Milik Kramzer. He was an influential preacher during the early Bohemian Reformation. He was a Czech Catholic priest in the 1350s and 60s, 
moving his way up the ladder. But in December of 1363, he resigned all of his Roman appointments to become a simple preacher. When he taught scholars, he would teach them in Latin. But when he taught the laity, he would teach in their native Czech and German languages, which he learned for that very purpose. They really wanted these people to, these common people to know the Bible. That's dedication, learning two languages just to preach the Bible. It absolutely is. And the Bible, previously only available in Latin, was translated into Czech by 1360. And that allowed anybody who was literate enough to read it to ask further questions on church policy and their practices. Kramser saw the evils of the Roman Catholic Church, and he started to view it as the abomination of desolation. And if you recognize that phrase, it's used a lot in the book of Daniel. He even stated that the Antichrist had come. In 1367, he traveled to Rome to expound these views to Pope Urban V. When he got to the gate of the original St. Peter's Basilica, he affixed a placard announcing his sermon. But before he got to preach it, he was thrown in prison by the Inquisition. Now, the Inquisition was a group of institutions within the Roman church who aimed to combat heresy, apostasy, blasphemy, witchcraft, and customs deviant. They were the misinformation squad of today, Chris. <laughs> they certainly were. The Inquisition used threats, violence, and torture to extract confessions and denunciations from heretics. And this could have been Kramser's fate, but he was released by Pope Urban V, so he returned to preaching. Yeah, we're going to talk more about the Inquisition. They were pretty nasty. Another Bohemian reformer, and I'm sorry, probably going to butcher this name, John Millick Cromorais. He was ordained in 1350, and he was working his way up the chain, eventually becoming treasurer of St. Vitus's Cathedral in Prague. Eventually, he became repelled by the corruption that he saw in the Roman church, and he resigned his office in 1363 and went into seclusion. When he emerged, he devoted himself to preaching tenets of church reform, and he attacked the Roman Catholic Church for being secularized. Hmm. Cromarese is seen as someone very much like a Puritan pastor, partly because he highly emphasized the scripture as the rule and authority for life. He preached in Czech and German rather than Latin, something that gained him popularity among the laity. I mean, you can imagine, who wants to sit and listen to someone talk in a language you can't understand? Right. He was convinced that the Roman church and society was so degenerate and immoral that the end of the world and the coming of the Antichrist would soon happen. So see, they even thought it back then. Yep. In the spring of 1367, he traveled to Rome and preached for moral conversion to the papal court. This caused him to be imprisoned by the Inquisition, but he was soon released. Later that year, he presented Pope Urban with a pamphlet called the Booklet of the Antichrist, in which he urged the Pope to convene a general council to reform the church. He returned to Prague and began preaching daily sermons at the cathedral in Latin for the clergy and then in Czech for the people. His sermons got distributed throughout Central Europe. Calls for the reformation of the Roman church came from other priests and theologians in Bohemia. There was Matthew of Krakow. He was a theology professor at the University of Prague. He called for reform in front of Pope Urban VI in 1382, and Matthias of Genov. He was an ecclesiastical writer who advocated for the removal of saints and their relics from the churches. And there were others, but by far the most famous Czech reformer was John Huss, who was greatly influenced by the teachings of John Wycliffe, like we mentioned last week. Huss was born to the peasant class, and he learned the scriptures from his mother, who read to him from the Bohemian Bible and encouraged him to enter the priesthood to have a better life. He graduated, and he was teaching at the University of Prague by 1398. He was appointed priest of the Bethlehem Chapel in 1402, and that chapel seated over 3,000 people. And Huss gave two sermons a week. That same year he was when he was introduced to the works of John Wycliffe by his friend, Jerome of Prague. 
Like Wycliffe, these two friends began condemning the Roman church for selling church offices to their friends and family, for selling indulgences, and for the Roman church's opulence and their moral decay. One of the main practices that Huss and his friend Jerome condemned was the practice of the priest giving only the bread to the laity during the Eucharist and keeping the wine totally for themselves. Huss advocated for the practice of offering both bread and wine to all Catholics in good standing during Mass. And this became the central rallying point for the Hussite movement, which we're going to talk about in a minute. We're not finished with John Huss's story yet, but other things were happening during this time as well. Yeah, the papacy began to have more of its own internal power struggles, this time between two rival bishops. Although the papal state had been established in Rome and Italy in 756, beginning in 1309, seven successive popes resided in Avignon, France, instead of the papal lands in in Italy. Pope Gregory the 11th returned the papacy to Rome in 1377, but he died a year later, and he was succeeded by Pope Urban VI, which didn't go over well. Yeah, when that happened, the French cardinals in Avignon decided to elect their own pope, and they did, Clement VII. He claimed to be the true pope. The Roman Catholic Church continued with two popes in two different locations for quite a while. Urban VI in Rome was followed by four more popes who reigned in Rome, and Clement of Avignon was followed by an Avignon pope, Benedict XIII. Having two popes was a problem, but it gets worse. In 1409, the Roman Catholic Church attempted to resolve the power struggle at the Council of Pisa. Their idea was to depose both the Roman pope and the Avignon pope as schismatical heretical, perjured, and scandalous. But the council only proceeded to make things worse by electing Peter Filargi, the Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, as a third pope, who they named Pope Alexander V. When he died, he was succeeded by Pope John XXIII, now referred to as an anti-pope, not as a pope. In 1414, John XXIII convened a council called the Council of Constance to resolve the problem once and for all, because three popes is too many. Yeah, one pope is too many, but (laughs) yes. It took three years for the council to work out the details of deposing popes and voting for a new pope, Pope Martin V, into office. Getting rid of the extra popes wasn't the only reason the Council of Constance was held. This was also their opportunity to try John Huss for heresy. John Huss, who had preached the gospel to thousands, was tried and found guilty of heresy. John Huss was executed in 1415, and a year later, his friend and co-reformer, Jerome of Prague, was executed also. The martyrdom of Huss sparked the Hussite Wars. The martyrdom of his friend a year later fueled it. The conflict was between Roman Catholic loyalists and the followers of Huss's vision of church reform. Although there were a few factions of Hussites with various ideas of church reform and how it should look, most of the time they united in their opposition against Rome. The Hussite War began on July 30th, 1419, when Catholic officials refused to surrender some Hussite captives in Prague. In response, Czech priest Jan Zalewski Future General Jan Ziska and a mob of peasant followers marched through the streets of Prague. And as they passed the town hall, someone threw a stone down at them. The Hussites stormed the hall and hurled seven members of the city council out of the high windows. Killed all seven of them. Yeah, and that was followed by continued ransacking of Roman Catholic establishments throughout Bohemia. Pope Martin V launched the first of several crusades against the Hussites, causing the destruction of many towns and villages and many cities. Casualties were high on both sides of the fighting, and they were high in the communities that the Roman church attacked because people died from exposure or from starvation because their homes and their crops were being destroyed. The Hussites were determined to see religious reform. Despite the fact that they were often outnumbered, 
they were strategic on the battlefield and they were innovative. They even came up with what's called the war wagon and they fortified their normal wagons with metal and they used them as barricades in open fields. Now, both men and women fought on the battlefield. They used farm implements, crossbows, and they even became proficient in the use of handheld firearms. Yeah, and they were dangerous at that time because a lot of times they just backfire. Yeah. In all of these wars, the monarchy, its relation to the Roman Catholic Church, political alliances, and the aspirations of each of the rulers or those under them played a huge role in how these conflicts played out. The Hussites articulated their stance in what's called the Four Articles of Prague, freedom to preach the word of God from scripture, freedom of the chalice in communion, prohibition on clergy owning large estates or serving in positions of secular authority, and punishment for mortal sins regardless of social standing. They were getting punished for mortal sins. Yeah. But the Pope and the rest of the hierarchy were not. Peace was agreed on at the Council of Basel in 1436, which granted Bohemia the freedom of religion. And although officially the Hussite Wars lasted from 1419 to 1436, they had further conflicts that ensued that weren't even totally resolved until the era of the Protestant Reformation actually happened and maybe even a little bit later. And you're talking 100 years, almost 100 yeah. years. That's a long time. And that's where we're going to end for today. We figure we probably taxed your brain enough. But join us next week as we look at what was going on prior to the Reformation in three more countries and the effects that it had. Today, we want to give a shout out to our listeners in Belarus, Cuba, and the Netherlands. Have a blessed day, everyone. And give him the glory, great things he has done.